Hi, everyone. Welcome to the virtual ALS Patient Caregiver Information Forum. My name is Kasmina Dabula, and I will be moderating the session on behalf of the ALS Canadian Alliance. So just before we get started, a few housekeeping points. Please click the Q&A button uh, on the bottom to submit to your question or raise your hand if you want to ask a question verbally. We will be getting to all of the questions at the end. And also please note that this session is being recorded. Here is our agenda for today. We will start off with some welcome and introductions, following by ALS patient testimonials and continue with care options to manage symptoms and then an overview of approved therapies for ALS. We will then end the session with a Q&A. So the ALS Canadian Alliance collectively strives to enhance the quality of life for all people living with and affected by ALS and supporting research to find the cause and cure. The founding members are the ALS Societies of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Prince Edward Island. It is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today, we have Paula Trefiak, who is an individual with ALS from Regina, Saskatchewan. She is a member of End the Legacy, a board member with the ALS Society of Saskatchewan, an ALS advocate with NEALS and ALS Canada, a community representative with the Canadian Scientific and Medical Advisory Council, and a member of the advisory committee with the International Alliance of ALS MND Associations. With us today, we also have Mike and Carmen Sells, who live in Oakville, Ontario, although both have roots in Western Canada. Mike and Carmen had successful careers in the pharmaceutical industry, Mike as a senior executive in commercializing medicines for Canadians, and Carmen in the human resources and training areas. In fact, that is how they met more than 30 years ago. They still live in the house they moved to when they got married and where they raised their two children. Both Mike and Carmen participated publicly in the 2014 Ice Bucket Challenge and never dreamed that that would be the first of a lengthy journey of advocacy and fundraising or that the cause would become even more personal. Carmen's paternal grandmother died of ALS more than 40 years ago. Mike was diagnosed with ALS just before his 54th birthday in late 2017 and is glad to share he has recently celebrated his 60th, having lived with ALS for more than six and a half years. Carmen is on leave from her work and is primary caregiver to Mike. After diagnosis, the two traveled to more than 30 countries until the pandemic shut down travel. Dr. Andrew Eisen is Professor Emeritus at the University of British Columbia. He is a graduate of the University of Leeds in England. He completed his residency in neurology at the Montreal Neurological Institute at McGill University, where he was appointed staff from 1968 to 1980. He moved to Vancouver, British Columbia in 1980, where he developed the Neuromuscular Diseases Program and Provincial ALS Center and Clinic. At UBC, he was Associate Dean of Research, Head of Medicine, and Head of Neurology. Dr. Eisen has written extensively on ALS in books and peer-reviewed journals. In 1999, he received the prestigious Forbes Norris Award for Compassion and Love of Humanity in the Study, Management, and Support of ALS and Motor Neuron Disease. He is a former president of the American Association of Neuromuscular and Electrodiagnosis Medicine. Dr. Eisen has received multiple awards, including the British Columbia Community Achievement Award and the Queen Elizabeth Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of his work in ALS. Dr. Eric Pyro is the newly appointed ALS BC Society Chair and Professor of Neurology at the UBC Department of Medicine. Dr. Pyro is a clinician scientist with expertise in neuromuscular neurology who diagnoses and cares for patients with ALS and related disorder. Dr. Pyro received his MD from the University of Calgary and his PhD from the University of Oxford. He completed his neurology residency at the MNI McGill University with additional training in MRR there and in neuropathology at the Mayo Clinic. Dr. Pyro directed the section of ALS and related disorders as the chair in ALS research at the Cleveland Clinic Learner College of Medicine. In that role, over two decades, he diagnosed and managed over 2,500 patients with ALS and was PI on several ALS clinical trials. He has been awarded and published extensively, receiving NIH and other agency funding. Dr. Pyro is committed to developing an ALS clinical research group at UBC that will allow patients with ALS to participate in various studies and clinical trials testing potential novel therapies. Then we have Dr. Colleen O'Connell, 
who is a professor of physical medicine and rehabilitation at Dalhousie University and a member of the Canadian ALS Research Network. She is a medical director and research chief of New Brunswick Stan Cassidy Center for Rehabilitation, where she is lead of the provincial ALS clinic. Believing in strength of collaboration or having difficulty saying no, she joins many networks and guidelines committees, including the Canadian ALS Best Practice Recommendations and Faculty of the Breaking the News in ALS Education Program. As co-chair of the World Health Organization World Rehabilitation Alliance, she collaborates with an international team to advocate for the strengthening of rehabilitation and health systems. She has authored and provided technical guidance on rehabilitation in challenging regions with infield emergencies, humanitarian work, including Haiti, Nepal, and Ukraine. And last but not least is Dr. Theodore Mobak, who is a neurologist, neurohospitalist, and neuromuscular specialist in Calgary, Alberta. He has been actively involved in the Calgary ALS Clinic for six years and director of the ALS Clinic in Calgary for four years. He is involved in several multicenter clinical trials for ALS therapeutics, including trials involving Tofferson, a treatment he will cover more in his talk today. Dr. Mobak enjoys running with his kids in the annual ALS Betty's Run each year in Calgary. Perfect. So we can start with the presentations. I will share my screen and invite uh, Paula Trefiak to share her experience uh, living as a person living with ALS. A moment. Thank you, the ALS Canadian Alliance, for having me here today. My name is Paula Trafiak. I'm from Regina, Saskatchewan, and I'm affected by SOD1 ALS. I grew up with the knowledge that some days, some ways, somehow, everybody dies. And that ALS is how the majority of people die on my father's side of the family. Approximately 75% of my father's family are gene carriers of a genetic variation of ALS called SOD1. This genetic variation affects less than 1% of all familial ALS cases. Now this variant doesn't affect one person at a time. It has always affected multiple people in my family all at once. Moreover, the disease affects everybody in my family differently. Some people like myself became symptomatic in their 20s. Other people became symptomatic in their 60s. Some people pro progressed faster, other people progressed slower. We've seen offspring of a symptomatic individual develop symptoms and progress faster and lose their battle with ALS before their symptomatic parent. And it's not uncommon in my family for people earlier on in their disease progression to be caring for a family member who is later on in their disease progression. And I can tell you from experience that familial ALS is next level devastation. Now, interestingly, my father's diagnosis hit me harder than my own diagnosis. His diagnosis meant that my, symptom, my siblings and I were officially potential gene carriers. And that is heavy news for an adult, let alone young adults between the ages of 10 and 21 years old, like my siblings and I were at the time of his diagnosis. Back then, Mental health was a taboo subject. There was no genetic counseling or psychological supports. 
The physician who diagnosed my father literally shook his hand and said it was nice knowing you and then left us to process the information in our own way. Needless to say, I found myself in a very dark state several years later. And eventually I had to make a decision. Do I continue to let this grief consume me? Or do I put my unique experiences to good use? to drive change that will improve the lives of the next generation of people affected by ALS. I chose to use my unique, to put my unique experiences to good use. And I held on to that choice when I was finally diagnosed with ALS in February of 2016. Because honestly, why would I waste such a unique opportunity? Making that decision and putting it into action, though, was easier said than done. Um, first, I mean, I had to deal with um, my high emotions over seemingly little things, little triggers that would occur. It required me to complete intensive psychological counseling to help me move forward with the waves of grief and trauma triggers. And secondly, I had to practice recognizing neg negative beliefs and reframing them. For example, I would often catch myself labeling something or some event as good or bad when in reality, they were neutral until I labeled them and I chose to label them good, bad, opportunity, or threat. And I had to consciously and actively practice reframing things as an opportunity whenever possible. And I decided to view my, um, my diagnosis as that opportunity to use my body, my skills, and my experiences to improve the lives of the next generation affected by ALS. Now, how did I put that into action? Well, um, I advocated for pre-symptomatic genetic testing for potential gene carriers of known ALS genes. And today, this genetic testing is available in certain clinics in Canada. And it's helping gene carriers participate in research and clinical trials today. To help advance research, I spent eight years participating in various ALS research opportunities. And I've also participated in the Valor Clinical Trial and the Topherson Open Label Extension to help advance SOD1 research and drug development. So that hopefully there will be an effective treatment available, if not for myself, for the next generation. My friends and family can attest to my interesting experiences participating in clinical trials. And so today, I get to use my clinical trial and open label extension experience to effectively advocate for patient advocacy or sorry, for patient uh, advisory in the full clinical trial process. And I currently serve on a number of patient advisory boards for various clinical trials to improve patient experiences. I also advocate for Health Canada priority review of treatments for rare diseases and, accel and accelerated approval pathways of Health Canada approved treatments in Canada so that people with ALS can access the next generation of effective treatments as soon as possible 
instead of waiting years. This ongoing advocacy work involves working with members of the federal and provincial government. And hopefully we will see uh, advanced priority review and accelerated pathways sooner than later. Now, when I was diagnosed with ALS, Saskatchewan did not have an ALS specialist or an ALS multi multidisciplinary clinic. I actually had to travel out of province for ALS multidisciplinary clinic care and across the country to participate in um, the Valor trial. And I must say, it was such an honor to have Dr. Schallenberg uh, consult with me as she was trying to establish the ALS multi multidisciplinary clinic here in Saskatchewan. And it was a dream come true when I could finally receive ALS multidisciplinary care here in my own province. And I continue to work with Dr. Schellenberg to help improve services and to expand on services as well. And I hope to eventually bring services dedicated, services and programming dedicated to the healthy child development of children who have a parent or loved one affected by ALS. Now I'm often asked, how do I find the time for everything? And to be honest, I don't always have the time and energy to accomplish everything. Um, but I do have to realize that um, I'm not the only one here working alone. I make small contributions here and there. Just like all the other amazing and inspiring ALS advocates across Canada, including Mark, or Mike and Carmen Sells, who you're going to meet next. And our drops in the bucket are making significant changes in the ALS landscape here in Canada. So be gentle on yourself, take breaks as needed and do what you can, because this is a crazy ride and we are all in this together. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Paula, for sharing your experience with us. I will now share a video from Mike and Carmen. Hello, everybody. We hope that you're doing well. Mike and I want to thank you very much for your kind invitation to joining today's event. We were sent some questions ahead of time so that Mike could prepare on his eye gaze technology. So I will ask him some questions and then I will allow Mike time to reply. And then I will add my own comments if I have any. So the first question, Mike, was what goals did you set for yourself at the time of diagnosis and how or why did you choose these goals? At the time of diagnosis, I did set some goals for myself. Some were immediate and some were longer term. Short term goals initially focused on renovating our family home versus moving then supervision of renovations over the next six months. We had always planned to travel in retirement. Now we decided to move those plans forward aggressively. Business had taken me around the world, but business travel is not the same as leisure travel, and there were many places on our list to explore. We ended up visiting around 30 countries before the pandemic shut us down. To be honest, we were at the point where travel was getting harder due to my progression, and my sister, 
A retired nurse was with us on our last trip. But while we were doing it, I always had something to look forward to. Longer term goals included seeing both of our children complete their post-secondary education. Our youngest was just entering into grade 12, and I wanted to beat the odds and see them graduate. I'm pleased to say that our oldest, Cynthia, has graduated from music and digital media and is working in her first career job. And our youngest, Jonathan, has graduated from software engineering and just started his first career job a few months ago. So now I need some new long-term goals. So Mike mentioned renovating, which of course was an outcome of his choosing to uh, stay at home and live with his ALS here as long as possible. Mike's goal is to live out his days here at home and we're set up for that. I think my own goals have evolved from learning all I could about the disease um, and then how to manage it with available resources to finally trying to keep Mike as comfortable for as long as possible here at home. My goals every day have gone from just coping to being a bit more mindful and appreciative of the small moments. I think people use the term living with ALS a lot. I have said in the past that we went from living in fear to actually living, just living with ALS and everything else that it sends our way. Life throws all sorts of stuff at you, right? So what gives us both purpose today is in advocating, educating, and raising awareness about ALS and the issues surrounding it. So Mike was also asked, what went through your mind at the time of diagnosis? At the time of diagnosis, not much was going through my mind. That's because I was in total shock. I was always active, and at the time of diagnosis, I was in the best condition in years. In fact, I spent the better part of the first year with my head buried in the sand. I didn't want to accept it. Now I don't recommend that approach. Time is so precious. Fortunately for me, Carmen did the opposite and really dug into the information, particularly what might be coming to prepare for. So she was ahead of me absorbing the new reality. So although I don't recommend burying head in the sand, it's just what I had to do. If you like me, needing time to absorb it all, my experience tells me I can get to a place of acceptance. I don't have to like it, but I need to accept it to move on and take action to help prepare. And so the next question Mike was asked was, talk about the importance of leveraging the resources within the multidisciplinary care team. The multidisciplinary clinic approach has been very beneficial for us. Having every specialist available on clinic days means I don't have to run around to different offices and clinics. Also, the team approach gives me good communication and sharing of pertinent information from my medical file. From OT to respirology, to adaptive technology, to name a few, saving countless hours. Once in advanced ALS everything takes more time and effort. So having one place for everything saves energy for other things. As I progress, everything gets more challenging. Mike was also asked, what advice would you give to other people living with ALS and their families and caregivers? The only advice I would give to those living with ALS and their caregivers and families is don't wait. My own experience burying my head in the sand tells me I wasted precious time. Approach everything with a sense of urgency, because things take time. Whether planning renovations, a trip, or just a family gathering, tackle it with a sense of urgency. Not panic, in control, and based on what is important to you. Simply don't wait. When I was uh, first starting to join the ALS Society's caregiver meetings, I used to go to these support meetings with a notebook, and I asked all sorts of questions, and I researched so many things to try and find solutions um, about the practical challenges of living with the changes that are brought about by ALS. I learned a lot from the people who came before us, and over time, I've become one of the people and the veterans that people come to for experience and ideas. I suggest people uh, assemble a trusted team 
as soon as you can begin processing and start to live with the implications of ALS, try and find people who can help you. Ask your ALS society for their resources, investigate government programs, check out your own private insurance plans if you have them, accept help whenever and however it is offered as soon in the process as possible. And remember that caregivers need to stay healthy and resilient. So place importance on your own health and well-being. It's as important because you need to be there in the long term. So the next question was about the diagnosis. So Mike, given the gravity of the diagnosis, how did you come to the decision to fight ALS every step of the way? Understanding not everybody may take the same approach. ALS is a very difficult and dire diagnosis to be given. I understand that different patients will react differently to the diagnosis. My own philosophy is to get up and show up every day. I have many days when it would be easier to stay in bed, but I simply have too much to do. I made the decision to fight ALS every step of the way. That means I have to get ready to face it every day. Part of doing this is to ensure I have the support I need to do that. I take around 3-4 hours to get up, shower if a shower day, rest, eat and then take a meds. That leaves the afternoon to connect with friends and family and take on advocacy projects. This keeps me engaged and involved. I rely on the iGaze computer for all communications, so it's an integral part of how I face each day. I realize quality of life means different things to different people. For me I needed a purpose. Days like today, for instance. So overall, I think the approach gives me that purpose. You know, Mike celebrated his 60th birthday not that long ago. And, you know, he has a full life. He's got amazing friends, a supportive family. And he recently, we've launched our young adult children. So Mike's mind is sharp, is engaged, and he interacts with the world just in a different way than he used to. It has simply never crossed his mind that he would relinquish anything to ALS even one second earlier than he needed to and before he had no choice. His unwillingness to yield to ALS has led to a few falls. Maybe he did bedroom transfers and bedside transfers a little too long before using a lift. You know, eating and drinking orally, we probably went just a little too far before giving that up. But, you know, Mike's parents are both 91 years old and they have fought ailments, big and small, and they continue to do so to this day. So I think a lot of this is just in Mike's DNA that he's going to fight no matter what. And we just manage it as we can. So then the next question we were asked, is there anything that we wish that could have been handled differently by anyone on the ALS care team or anyone involved in his ALS care. And I would say this, that Mike's pathway to ALS diagnosis is actually relatively short compared to many, many patients. Um, when he was getting his first electromyography, the neurologist had a pretty good idea of what it was. He didn't tell Mike though. He just said, we're gonna refer you to a specialist. And so Mike got an appointment and he called that specialist office to please move it up because it was a bit far away for us. We were waiting to hear the news, as you know. And um, that is when he was told, oh, and you know, those ALS clinics, they get really busy. So that's as early as we're going to be able to see you. And that was the first time we heard of ALS being a potential uh, diagnosis or that it had entered anybody's head. So we were very nervous about that. And it was very um, overwhelming. So that was a tough way to hear about the diagnosis. And then when we actually went to that specialist, he said, look, it's not firm, but I would bet that you do have ALS. So when we left there without a firm diagnosis, we felt super overwhelmed, very confused, not very supported. And so we would just want to say that as soon as there's a clear diagnosis, it's really important to, to find out information so you can start applying to various programs like wow. all your, your handicapped disabled parking pass, for example, or CPP. Carmen and I wish. 
And uh, I think that it's, it's one of the most vulnerable times, actually. People need to feel hope and support and that there are actions to take to manage and plan. Another thing that we found challenging, which is not ALS specific, was just that we live in a different region than, than Mike's ALS clinic. And so records aren't easily shared. And in the early days, we actually had to physically drive test results from our local hospital to the ALS clinic in a different region, which becomes an obstacle in patient care. And you know, the third thing, of course, that happened was the pandemic. Mike was just starting to receive PSW home care, and we actually had PSWs deny care. They were our uh, staff, if you will, and they denied care. So they were so frightened by the virus that we caught that um, all of this really demonstrated that home care wasn't necessarily well considered through um, how the system works. And I think all of these examples really show the importance of having someone to advocate for the patient and their families. So for us having a, a really persistent and vocal advocate, especially as the ALS patient starts to lose their voices literally, and also when their hands and fingers can no longer type, they need someone who can vocally and very insistently advocate on their behalf. Patient navigators to guide families through would be a really great role. And we have one last statement, and we just want to say thank you very much for your time. And Mike has a comment as well. Herman and I wish to thank the ALS Alliance and everybody on today's panel. We are happy to be a part of such an important resource for families with ALS. Please do not hesitate to reach out to the organizers for our contact information in case you have questions in the future. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Mike and Carmen. We will then move on to Dr. Eisen's presentation. I will share my screen. Oh, Dr. Eisen, you're muted. There we go. Maybe it's better if I'm unmuted. <laughs> um, thank you for allowing me to say a few words. But, you know, I've listened to Mike and Carmen, and um, I'm sorry, it was Cosmina, the other lady. I'm so impressed. You know, I'd like to spend time with the three of you and get to know you more. I, You know, I've had a philosophy in life. If you learn something every day, you've done okay. And I've learned so much from the three of you, it's just been a joy listening to you. And actually, Mike and Carmen, I think what I'm going to say is sort of a bit irrelevant now because you've done it all for me in a much, much nicer way. You really have. You've hit all the, the key strokes and the important issues. Anyway, for the next few minutes, I, I want to talk a little bit about symptoms, not symptoms that come along with ALS, and we may tend to it ignore them and then no, not quite know what to do about them. But they are important because, you know, until we get a cure, we will get a cure. I promise you within the next few years, we're going to get definitive treatment for ALS. But until that happens, it's important that we try and treat symptoms because that clearly adds um, to quality of life. So I've listed here a list of, and the, Everybody's different, and there's no special order to this, but some of the things that people experience as disease goes along, some of them occur earlier, some of them occur later. And I'm just going to go through some of these. There are others, and my colleagues, I'm sure, will think of other ones. But I'm going to go through a few of them and then make some comments, and hopefully in the discussion we can answer questions on some of the, the other ones. 
So if I could have my first slide. You move on. Next one. Okay. So, you know, breathing is a major issue at some time in ALS, sometimes early, often much later. Um, and early intervention of using a BiPAP, um, you know, when I started off respiratory care, you needed your bed and you need a, another room to put the machine in. Now you can almost put a BiPAP in your pocket. It's amazing how, and the technology will improve even more with, with time. So early use of BiPAP is, is valuable. It's not something you have to do for many hours a day, just a short time at the beginning and then increase it later on. But it does a lot for you. It helps with so many other things. <clears throat> you know, it helps with you getting fatigued during the day, um, with cognitive function, and in fact, with sleeping at night, which is important. Okay, next one, please. Um, so I'm, this slide is going to get very busy towards the end. As I said, there's no special order to this. Sleep is a is a problem in ALS for many different reasons. It's actually an important issue. I don't have time. I, I, I could spend an hour talking to you about sleep because there's some very interesting aspects to it. But um, it is an issue. And... There are things you can do. I've just put down a couple of things here. Emma vein is, is a very safe um, hypnotic. Um, if you haven't used it, it's worth trying in a very small, small dose. Um, maybe just you can cut the pill in half easily. The only bad thing about it gives it sort of nasty metallic taste in some people. <clears throat> Melatonin and in small doses is also worth trying. You have to play around with it a bit because some people take very little, other people need a bit bit more. And there are other things, but these are safe measures and it's anyway it's an important issue to try and get around. Okay, thank you. Next one. Well we have <coughs> people in physical medicine on this team who know much more about this than I do. <coughs> but Mobility, obviously, is an important issue. One of the things that I've always tried to advocate for, it, it's very natural for patients not to want to use walkers and then later on wheelchairs because they feel, well, I've, I'm giving in, this is the end. When it isn't the end, actually what it does, it gives you a whole new life. So I really advocate for early use of mobility help. Um, I mean, get a wheelchair, get a motorized wheelchair early, not late. It will make a world of difference. You can go down to the corner store, go meet your friends for coffee, which you couldn't do before, and, and life will be so much better for you. And I think Mike and Carmen have shown that they're making use of all these great technologies. And next one. Um, and the same goes for manipulation, particularly for hand use. There are a lot of very clever things one can do now, and <clears throat> we may get into that later in discussion, but the physical medicine um, specialists are very good at adaptive handles and so on. And they're some easy tricks, but do them early. Do all of this early on in the disease. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now, drooling Drooling can be a, a problem for some people. Um, with saliva, it's, it's quite unpleasant. Um, and again, you can treat this quite nicely. There are medications, I've just suggested Artane there, but there are many others. Um, but a good treatment is radiation of the parotid gland. Um, it's not for everybody. <laughs> but it can be quite successful and it'll last for quite a while, certainly maybe four, six months, and then you may have to have a repeat radiation to them, but it reduces the, the drooling and the saliva quite dramatically. So that's something, if you don't know about it, worth talking to your neurologist about. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and 
Swallowing is obviously can become a major issue with time. And again, I, I advocate for early use of a peg tube. Unfortunately, what happens is, again, and it's natural to be resistant, but many patients wait rather long. And if you wait too late for a peg tube to be put in, it's counterproductive. In fact, it's dangerous and it's not, you shouldn't do it then. So it's much better to do these things early. If you have a peg tube in, it doesn't mean you can't eat by mouth. If you can, you can take your pills and things you don't like through the tube and you can eat your chocolates and ice cream by mouth. So you can combine the two. It's perfectly okay to do that. But don't wait too late for these things because then it becomes dangerous and, and difficult. Okay, thank you. People don't always recognize that pain can be a major issue in ALS for many reasons for lack of mobility, muscle aches and pains, <clears throat> joints get disabled and so on. So pain is an issue and uh, um, it is part of the disease and it should not be ignored. Um, it's responsive like all other pain, to, usually to simple analgesics. Um, I'm not a great advocate of marijuana, but some people have found it useful and helpful and that's okay. You know, I think with a disease like ALS, I'm <clears throat> I'm <clears throat> never opposed to any suggestions. <clears throat> I think alternative medicines and so on are all worth taking very seriously. <clears throat> Excuse me, I would avoid using opiates, so it's not a good thing to do because it interferes with breathing and you don't want to do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> obviously, communication is a is a big issue. Mike has solved it beautifully, as he showed you this morning. Um, and <clears throat> there are quite a number of ways now, and artificial intelligence is coming on and doing its job job very well. <clears throat> I think there's a rather nice approach. You can early on in your disease, or maybe even before, just as a safeguard, you can store speech store all sorts of speech, even on an iPhone now, and then you can use it later on when you need it. So <clears throat> make use of, um, of speech software <clears throat> and technology. It's a great help in communication. You know, before this sort of stuff came along, it was much more, much more difficult than it is now. Um, I'm sure many of you <coughs> have watched um, Hawkins talk for many years on his uh, on his computer to the world, give world lectures to all over the world. He does, did a great job. So Stephen Hawkins. Okay, thank you. Next one. Yes, thick phlegm can be a problem, just the same way as drooling can be a problem. Mucus can become thick as well and can be an issue. <clears throat> and there are ways of dealing with that fairly easily. You know, the old steam inhalation with a towel over your head is, is very comforting and very helpful and a simple thing to do. Um, and there are the, uh, there are expectants and other sort of medications one could use as well. So, again, all of these things I'm sort of highlighting, it, don't, don't ignore them. Push your neurologist to say, well, do something about this because it makes life so much more comfortable for you. Okay, thank you, next one. Unfortunately, the, the uh, screen is getting a bit crowded at this point. Um, so, you know, anxiety and depression are, as you've heard today already, <clears throat> are common issues with ALS quite naturally. There's perfectly normal thing to get upset, depressed, and anxious about what's going to happen. <clears throat> but they need treating. We're very lucky here in, in Vancouver to have excellent psychological counseling. And I think ALS counselors are a great route to go um, in addition to medications. But I think counseling is a preferred early thing to do before one starts on antidepressants and 
anti-anxiety medications. <clears throat> um, they're complex things and they need looking into by professionals because it isn't all just simple depression. Other things can be happening at the same time and you need to be able to sort out exactly um, what the problem is. Okay. Um, <clears throat> emotional ability, if, if you're not sure what I'm talking about there, it's, this, you, you, it's the urge to either want to laugh or cry and not be able to stop. So if someone tells you a joke and you normally can stop laughing, but quite often with ALS, you can't stop. You continue laughing in the same way if you see a movie and you get sad about it, you cry a little bit. But with ALS, you may go on crying. <clears throat> and for many years, people said, oh, this is all to do with, you know, nonsense. These people are just stupid or something. And it's not nothing to do with stupidity. You, you probably know when you've been tested for your reflexes in your arms and legs, they jump much more easily than they did before you got the disease. Well, emotional ability is exactly the same issue. You lose the inhibitory control to the muscles that you use for crying and and <clears throat> and for laughing, um, which actually crying, you know, is unique to humans. I don't know whether you're aware of that. I don't think other animals cry. They certainly laugh. Great apes laugh but I don't think they cry. I'm not sure about that. Anyway, that's the mechanism, and it can be dealt with the same way as the elasticity and stiffness in the arms and legs can be dealt with. So it's, an, it's a real thing, it's an important thing, and there's an explanation for it. And, okay. And although the textbooks and people will tell you that the bladder and bowel function are preserved in ALS, they are often for a long, long time, but not, <clears throat> not indefinitely. You can begin to get um, bladder issues um, and that constipation and urgency and so on. And they're reasonably easily dealt with and should be dealt with. Um, so I think that there are um, a host of other issues, but I think these are some of the more important ones that I wanted to bring it your attention and they're all as a, easily dealt with I think again as Mike and Carmen raised multidisciplinary clinics are so important because you get all this done at the same time and um, um, so that you know I, I always feel badly for patients who don't have access to a multidisciplinary clinic for ALS well I hope we can expand on some of these things when we have chance to have an open discussion later on, but I think I'll leave it at that for just now. And I'm happy to talk to any of you who are either, you know, through my email or whatever, who are watching this today. I'm pretty open to communicate with, and some of you want to write to me, please do so. I'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Eisen. Dr. Piero, you can share your screen and begin your presentation. Hear me okay? Yes. Can you see my uh, first slide all right? Yes. Okay, great. Well, it's my pleasure to uh, to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation by the organizers to be able to uh, to speak to you all uh, for a few minutes about Reusol um, and uh, its use in treating ALS. Fortunately, it's not the last medication uh, that is available for ALS. So 
these are my disclosures. Won't bore you with, with those. And today I wanted to talk about ALS, although you know it's been used as a treatment in ALS for many years, and, and we're all quite familiar with it. I'd like to present some information that may not be quite as well known to at least some of you, um, as shown in the outline of what I'll be discussing today. Glutamate is one of many neurotransmitters in the brain and spinal cord. Together, we think of these two regions as the central nervous system, or CNS. Glutamate, it's an important excitatory neurotransmitter, uh, meaning that it stimulates nerves to fire. It's involved in, in many uh, CNS circuits and functions, such as mood stabilization, uh, memory, and motor control. But although glutamate is an important neurotransmitter normally, when present in excess and overstimulating nerves in a variety of ways, as shown on the left, it's detrimental, it's harmful. As a result, this so-called glutamate excitotoxicity can result in a variety of neurologic and psychiatric diseases, including ALS. It's believed that excess glutamate is at least one of the mechanisms leading to the disorders shown here. Enter Rilizol, which was initially developed by a large French pharmaceutical company, Rome poulain coer in the late 1970s as an anti-seizure drug because of its ability to decrease glutamate excitation. As shown here, glutamate reduces activation of two types of glutamate receptors called NMDA and AMPA receptors, something like electrical outlets where glutamate plugs into to exert its effect. And the, it counteracts the abnormalities that's shown in the cartoon on the right. In number one, by decreasing glutamate release to reduce its amount found between nerve endings that gets left behind there and can overstimulate the nerves. In number two, by increasing removal of the glutamate that normally happens by the cells adjacent to nerves called astrocytes, whose glutamate transporters may not be working properly. And then also number three, Rilizol helps reduce activation of these NMDA and AMPA receptors by blocking their channels, mostly sodium channels. So the idea to use Rilizol in ALS came about after researchers discovered that one of the causes of ALS is the presence of too much glutamate in the CNS for some of the reasons that I mentioned. And abnormalities of these glutamate transporters was one of the first things that was found as well. So testing of Rilizol in ALS clinical, clinical trials began in the early 1990s, so quite a while back. After a pivotal study, meaning that it was a study that kind of proved that the drug was effective, it was published in 1994, showing that slowing of the development of weakness of muscles and prolongation of survival resulted. Although at the time with these initial studies, the survival benefit was only by about three months. Rilizol became the first treatment for ALS in Europe and the United States in 1995, and in Canada in 1997, about 27 years ago. It's been around for quite a while. In this first clinical trial that I, I'm showing you the front abstract of it, 155 participants with fairly advanced ALS were randomized one-to-one -one with 77 receiving 
100 milligrams of ridazol per day and 78 receiving placebo for a median duration of 19 months. So just over a year and a half or so. The study showed a 12 month survival in 74% of individuals receiving ridazol compared to 58% of those receiving placebo. Not that much of a difference, but an improvement of about 16% or so. This was statistically significant and translates to survival benefit for ridazol of about three months. This appeared to be driven mostly by those individuals with bulbar onset ALS. And in addition, worsening of muscle strength was significantly slower in participants receiving ridazol, although this latter point is often overlooked in subsequent reporting of the study's results, which is kind of interesting that, that that's not really mentioned very much. So benefits of ridazol then overall include increased survival, although initially thought to be primarily for bulbar onset patients, and slowing of muscle weakness. Interestingly, that original study that I mentioned also showed better bulbar function, so better swallowing, speech, saliva control, and breathing as well in those taking Riduzol. Riduzol is an oral medication, meaning that it's taken by mouth. It's easy to take, it's not injectable. After several years of, of the patent form, uh, brand, branded uh, Rilutec, as it was called, a much less expensive generic form is now available. And, and the price has really come down substantially, at least in the United States, um, where I was practicing before, the, uh, with insurance, Rilutec averaged about $1,000 per month out of pocket, which is a lot. While the generic, uh, which is now available for $20 or, or less per month, so substantially cheaper. So in addition to Riduzol being available as a tablet, it's now available as an oral film or wafer and also as a liquid, which makes taking the medication much easier since crushing the tablets can be a bit tricky. However, Riduzol is not a cure. So it, it extends survival by only a few months. And at least as revealed in the initial studies from the 90s, you know, it looked like it was only three months, but there is some evidence now that, that the data and the design and, and the way that the, the analysis was occurred uh, was, was performed is a little bit flawed. And so subsequent studies showing present-day use of Riduzol provides greater benefit. I'll, I'll discuss that uh, in the next couple of slides. Nonetheless, slowing of ALS progression is usually not something that the patient recognizes who's taking a Riduzol. And, and I often explain to individuals that you may not notice that it's doing anything, but it is. We know that it is because the clinical trials that were done, all the clinical trials that have, have occurred since the first ones that were uh, done in the 90s, demonstrate that Riduzol is effective and it does slow disease progression. However, taking it on an empty stomach, which results in the highest blood levels, can make side effects worse. And these are you know, things that can occur like stomach upset, for example, is, is pretty common. Um, fatigue, et cetera, and I'll mention that later. But those are some of the things that, that can occur. And also, it's sometimes inconvenient to have to regularly check blood cell counts and liver enzymes, but this is important to do on a regular basis, at least during the first year of taking the medication. And then after that, uh, annually, uh, just once a year is, is sufficient. So the side effects that I briefly mentioned before are generally infrequent though. So they occur in 10%, maybe up to 20%, depends on, on the study of individuals taking radiazol. And, it, and they're relatively mild. And when they do occur, tend to be short-lived. They're, they're fairly transient. So they'll go away with, if one persists and, and can stand, you know, 
continuing to take the medication. Nonetheless, some patients may not be able to tolerate it at all, although this is quite rare. And I usually find that most people are able to, um, to take Ridizol as I you know, instruct them to take it, uh, starting off with half the dose initially for the first week and then take it at the full dose twice a day after that. The last thing to mention here is that the liver enzymes, the transaminase enzymes, AST, ALT, may become elevated because the drug is broken down by the liver. So it's pretty normal to see those elevated, but if they become too elevated, uh, then it's necessary to, to hold the medication. Although this is pretty rare uh, to happen. Uh, I've only had to take uh, a couple of patients off it after having treated, uh, you know, over well over a thousand or more patients, obviously taking this medication. So just to end on a more positive note, the everyday use of Ridizol by patients with ALS in the real world appears to be more beneficial than the original study showed. And I'm not gonna go over all the data of that obviously, but I, I did wanna show you one publication that we review from a few years ago where 14 studies were, were examined uh, or analyzed that these 14 studies were looking at survival in individuals taking ALS compared to those that weren't. And they found that patients who took, sorry, who took Riluzol compared to those who didn't lived between six and 19 months longer, which is a bit better than the two to three months survival benefit that was seen in the original studies. And it's, it's not completely clear, but some reasons for this difference probably uh, include the way the data were analyzed previously, um, as well as the modern day practice now of, of starting Riduzol as soon as possible after a diagnosis of ALS is made. And I try to, to initiate Riduzol as long as the patient is willing to do so as soon as I give them the diagnosis, um, because it is easy to take, it's uh, much more affordable um, nowadays. And, and so it, it's clear that starting Riluzol as soon as possible early in the disease is when the benefit is maximized. So we certainly have a lot of evidence of that. But it's interesting that even later stages of ALS will benefit from taking Riluzol. So it's something that is worthwhile taking uh, for as long as possible, even as the disease progresses. So, those are the, the, the main things I wanted to, to highlight. Uh, as I said, these are some, some information that, that may not have been as known. Uh, I'm sure that we'll have a chance to uh, discuss more in the question and answer if you have any questions about uh, Riduzol and, and how I prescribe it, et cetera. Um, more than happy to discuss that uh, in the question and answer session as well. So thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Pyro. I will stop sharing my slides as soon as I can here. to find the right button. I think mine are already up, are they? I think, I think I've stopped sharing now, right? Uh, we still see your screen, Dr. Pyro. Oh, oh you do? Oh, I'm so sorry about that. Uh, okay, just a sec. Great, now we switching around. There we go. Okay, all right, there we go. Technology. No worries. Thank you so much, Dr. Pyro. And Dr. O'Connell, we see your Thank slides. You. Super. <laughs> Would you like me to go right ahead? <laughs> yes, you can start. Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much for inviting me to be here. It's my pleasure. I'm joining you from the very snowy East Coast. I'm in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and I'm a 
uh, a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist, and I lead the ALS clinic here in New Brunswick, and I'm based in Fredericton. And so for the next few minutes, I'm just going to be talking to you about another pharmaceutical option that is available here in Canada, which is Ederavone. Um, my disclosures to share, it's uh, basically I've uh, been quite involved with many of the clinical trials that have been happening here in the country over the past, oh, well, 20 years, but they've been a real acceleration in the last decade. And uh, so you can see from this, we've had numerous clinical trials at any one point in time, which has been really exciting to be involved with. And I think it's been something that many of the people affected by ALS that we work with um, ha have had, you know, some opportunities that maybe were not as readily available 15, 20 years ago when we had very few clinical trials at any one time. And so I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about this medication, Adaravone. Now this pretty complicated slide, but what I really like because, you know, ALS is complicated. And one of the challenges uh, to find pharmaceuticals or medications that work in the disease is because there are so many different ways that the neuron or other cells in our body can get hurt or injured due to various what we call pathological uh, or injury type of processes in our bodies. Um, this slide was from Dr. Angela Genge, who's another ALS clinician and researcher from McGill and a publication that they had just this past year, which gives a really nice overview about how we diagnose uh, ALS. But it's a nice way of looking at both the cellular mechanism, so looking at the neuron itself, as well as the other cells in our bodies and how they're involved in various ways of causing injury to a person who then experiences the symptoms of ALS. And one of these slides, if you look over here where it says toxic factors and you see this little number eight, you see a couple of cells here that aren't necessarily neurologic cells such as uh, microglia, and then you see this other nerve cell. And when we look at things like neuroinflammation, so inflammatory or inflammation affecting our, our, our cells that can cause injury. And this is one of the areas that the medication Ederavone works. So the medication Ederavone is a type of medication that is felt to reduce the amount of inflammation that's happening at neurons, as well as other cells in our body that affect how our neurologic systems work. It's in that family of what we call antioxidants. And many of you who might use or have thought about using um, over-the-counter products, you're probably familiar with many things out there that claim to be antioxidant. We know there's lots of natural antioxidants like blueberries and hascap berries, but this is really the, the mechanism by which this drug is felt to work, but it's not entirely 100% sure how it is working in, in ALS. The drug was originally approved uh, in, in Asia, and it was used for treating people very shortly after a stroke. Now, it became approved in Canada based on one, what we call the pivotal trial. And this was a study um, called, it, it had you know fancy name called the J19 study, but it basically involved just under 70 patients who were given the drug and about 70 patients who were given a placebo. And they were followed together for about three months time without any treatment. And then the, they received drug or placebo and they were followed to see what the impact of the medication was on what we call the ALS functional rating score. And for many of you who have ever gone to an ALS clinic, you probably got asked a number of questions from, from either the nurse or the doctor uh, or a researcher about your areas of function. And this is one of the main tools that's been used in a lot of the ALS studies for evaluating the effect of a medication. Um, and it's hard in ALS to, you know, we're using a questionnaire uh, about your 
opinion on things about your function as the main outcome. Not necessarily a blood test. It's not like, you know, we use a blood pressure medication and we can measure your blood pressure and say, aha, the drug worked or it didn't. But in this drug study with the Daravone, this was the main outcome measure. And so what it looks at is how an individual is functioning across 12 different domains of function. A average type of loss is losing one point on this scale every month. And so without losing any points. So someone without ALS would typically have a score of 48. And so the way the drug study worked was that for the first three months, they followed the ALS functional rating scale of everybody, nobody was getting drug and just watched what happened. You can probably see here that those lines are pretty much overlapped with each other. And then at the three month mark, half the group got the drug and half the group got placebo. And then they were followed for another six months. And we watched what happened to the score on that. And at the end of that six month period, there was a statistically mathematical significant difference between those that were on the drug and those that were on the placebo by about a 33% less functional loss. So it was on the basis of this study and that finding that the drug administered by IV was approved in Canada. Now, subsequent to that, the company that makes the medication did a study looking at comparing the IV intravenously administration of the drug to people getting the drug by mouth with the same a treatment schedule. And what they found was that the, what they call the bioavailability. So the amount of the drug that gets into your system was comparable, whether it was taken orally at a dose of 105 milligrams or by IV at a dose of 60 milligrams. And so with the finding that they were essentially equivalent the drug given by IV is generally not used anymore once Health Canada approved it orally. Now, in that study where I where I showed you that there were you know 68 and 69 people, to get into that study, it was really quite strict. And the participants in that study were generally in the earlier, stages of ALS. So they had had symptoms for less than two years. They still had to have really good pulmonary function as measured by the forced vital capacity. It had to be greater than 80% in order to get into the study. And their score on that ALS rating scale, they had to score two or higher in every single domain and they could not be using any type of ventilation at the time. And so we know ALS affects people very differently and at different rates. So this is a very narrow group of participants that were in that study that showed the difference. When the drug got approved in Canada, it goes through an evaluation process as well. It gets approved by Health Canada. And then there's uh, an organization called our Therapeutic and Drugs. It's the it's called CADETH, the Canadian Drugs and Therapeutics. Um, forget all the rest of the acronym, but uh, they make a determination on reimbursement, what the company is allowed to charge for the drug, and what the criteria should be to be able to get access to the drug. So a lot of insurance companies will wait until CADETH makes its decision. And then the insurance companies make their decisions about the medication. And in Canada, what most insurance companies have done, including where I live in New Brunswick and our, our, our even our government funded program, um, is that they've stuck to the very strict criteria that was used in that drug study. So in order to get access to the medication, have coverage, they had to meet those criteria of having two or more on the ALS rating scale, 80% functional vital capacity, less than two years, 
and not ventilated. And then they also had in, uh, put in place discontinuation criteria. And this is something we don't necessarily see in a lot of medications, but I think increasingly as the cost of drugs goes up, we're probably going to see things like this uh, more frequently. And again, this is sticking to some of the criteria within the study. And so insurance companies may be not renewing the, the, the coverage if person scores drop uh, below two on two of the items, the walking item and the hand function item, or if a patient is starting to you require non-invasive uh, or invasive ventilation on a permanent basis. So this is considered 22 hours or more. In general, the medication is really quite safe and, and it's fairly easy to dose, particularly now that it's available as an oral formulation. The main side effects have been around, uh, I think, well, when it was IV, it was getting some bruising at that site. We don't see that with the oral administration. Some patients re reported some gait disturbance or headaches. It's dosed a little funny, but this is because the way it was used in the acute stroke, and that's how the initial study was done, where a patient got it for 14 days straight, and then you had two weeks off, and thereafter you take it for 10 days out of every month. And so what it looks like is initially when you first start it, you're taking it every day for 14 days, and then you have two weeks off. And then every other two weeks, you'll be, you can take it for 10 days out of a two week period. Some people will do it Monday to Friday just because it's easier. Uh, others might do it for 10 days straight. It really, it, it hasn't really been shown to make a difference either way. There was one study uh, that was initiated uh, in Canada and I believe the United States was involved as well, where it was looking at using a daily dose of Adaravone compared to this schedule. And the study was stopped at the midway point because it wasn't showing that the daily dose made any, any difference at all. And so the, it, the study was determined to be non-futile or, or to be futile. And so the study was stopped and this has just continued. Um, some more data has been recently emerging around uh, Adaravone and, and it's you know, causing a lot of discussion among the ALS clinics and clinicians as we look at this evidence and try to use that to help us best inform our, our persons uh, and families that are affected by ALS. And some of these have to do with real world evidence data that's emerging and also results of other randomized controlled trials. Um, one of those studies uh, that was recently um, uh, released was called the ADORE study, which is using a type of Adaravone, a different formulation, and they used a slightly different inclusion, exclusion, and monitoring criteria. But the results of their study with their form of Adaravone turned out to be a negative study. Um, at the same time, we're getting evidence coming from some of the longer real world evidence studies. And these tend to be ones based on data registries, potentially where the pool of patients aren't quite so strictly controlled. And this study that was published just in 2022 looked at uh, just over 300 persons living with ALS in the United States who, um, were diagnosed with ALS at the time when Ederavone IV became available. And they took 300, I think 318 or 360, 318 patients who received Ederavone. And then they matched them to 318 patients who did not receive Ederavone, making sure that they had similar rilazole histories, age, time since disease onset, uh, use of feeding tubes. They did not have data on the ALS functional rating score or their breathing measures. So they couldn't balance them by that, but they did have data about hospitalization rates and feeding tube rates. So they tried to make the two groups as close as they could and then followed them. And 
their conclusions of this study were that the survival was significantly improved in those on the IV Adarivone, almost 30 months compared to just under 24 months. Uh, and as well, the death rates were lower uh, in the Adarivone group than the control group. And so we're, we're, it, it, it really comes down to understanding the literature Adaravone is available here in Canada, and uh, the consensus around many of the ALS clinics and, and clinicians in the country is that we do we do offer it. We support our patients in trying to access it, but we're cognizant of ensuring that the patients are meeting the criteria it, from the studies that did show that there was benefit for it. Uh, it has been around since 2018 and orally now since November of 2022. Uh, and in general, it's well tolerated. We don't need to follow any particular blood work. Uh, but as in any individual, we do encourage them to be followed through one of the ALS clinics. And so that's that's the end of my session. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connell. No problem. I'll stop share. <laughs> Great. I now invite uh, Dr. Mole back to start sharing his screen. Great, is the audio visual okay? Let me, yes, thank you so much. I think I'll just take the camera off. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, having me. It's my pleasure to be here today. And I, I have the opportunity to talk about two treatments uh, for ALS, tofersin and albriosa. And they they represent some of the highs and lows uh, within uh, the, the recent developments in ALS treatments. And so I will go through those uh, with you. I, I'm glad they've been partnered together for, for two reasons, really. Both of these treatments have had phase three studies that are negative, meaning they didn't meet their primary outpoint uh, and point, and, and yet they're going different directions in the ALS uh, space. And so that brings some confusion, and I'd like to provide some clarity for that. Secondly, these are two new treatments to, to come to market in the last few years, and that is the product of, of a great momentum in the ALS disease space and brings us hope and, and hope that this momentum brings more treatments to patients living with ALS. I do have a few disclosures here that I'll throw up uh, with all consulting relationships with uh, the companies that make uh, therapeutics in ALS. I'm going to start talking about Albriosa. This is AMX0035 called Albriosa in Canada, Relivrio in the United States. It's a combination therapy that's uh, a powder then combined into water to be a oral suspension of sodium phenylbutyrate and tallerosyl diol. There's great safety profile on it and, and reasonable tolerability with the side effects mostly affecting the gastrointestinal system with nausea, taste issues, diarrhea, abdominal pain. If you looked at the mechanism of action, you'd have to zoom in on the motor neuron, and I'm not sure you can see my mouse here. Let me see if I can get a laser pointer. There we go. You'd have to zoom in on the motor neuron and look inside the cell and look at these organelles, organ structures supporting the cell called the mitochondrial and endoplasmic reticulum to see that the medication might be helping those organelles handle the stress of the damaging motor nerve a little bit longer. But I like to zoom in on the cellular level on pathophysiology as, next, as much as the next ALS neurologist, but I also like to zoom out and conceptualize, you know, where in the disease do these mechanisms lie and, and work as, as understanding the treatment. And so I use this uh, upstream downstream terminology because I find it a helpful illustration. And, and so I'll go through that. And it's not just because I'm from Alberta and enjoy the mountains, but I think it can help us a bit. Upstream would be, in my consideration, the source. What's the cause of ALS? And full disclosure, we don't know all the causes of ALS. We know a lot, but not everything. And so there still is some uncertainty about what's causing things. The downstream effects would be the loss of motor neurons presenting with weakness and the manifestations of ALS. 
And in between these two is a cascade of motor nerve degeneration. Some through inflammation, excitotoxicity, changes in the cytoskeleton uh, structure of, of the neuron, the mitochondrial dysfunction, all these processes that a uh, sick nerve might go through between developing the starting process and the end stage. Nobody knows the true answer of where the treatments lie, but in my conceptualization of this, I would propose that most of the approved treatments are more downstream mechanisms. And this would include albreosa targeting the mitochondria and endoplasmic reticulum. This leads us to understand the disappointing news that came out two weeks ago, where Amalex, the company that makes Albriosa, announced that its phase three study called Phoenix didn't meet its primary or secondary endpoints. And there's no more graphs or, or, or tables to show from this yet because it's just a news announcement at this point in time. Uh, the full study will be published in the coming uh, months. However, it has important implications that I think we can go through together to provide a little bit of clarity. I wanna answer these questions in light of this news announcement. Why, was, why is Albriosa approved and now being taken away? Should I continue to take Albriosa? And what will happen to Albriosa in Canada? To answer these questions, we'll briefly touch on the pathway of new drug development. And this takes many years in, in most situations, starting from the basic science uh, idea, going into the lab with the animal and cell cultures and preclinical data. And once it comes to humans, it goes through three key stages of development. The first is phase one prioritizing safety, small numbers, often increasing doses, and the focus is purely on safety. Next stage is phase two, and this is proof of concept. We're exploring now, does the compound work a little bit? And still, is it safe? And finally, there's phase three, bigger study, more people. We really need to know now, does the drug work more than the placebo or not taking it. And still safety is a value in this phase, but the, the proof is, is on, you know, does, does it work? Then we go into the marketing and safety monitoring in phase four uh, studies. Most regulatory bodies that govern new medications to the market, FDA, Health Canada, the European equivalent EMA, approve drugs after phase three data shows the drug works. Albriosa received a conditional approval in June of 2022 by Health Canada because of the encouraging results initially seen in their phase two trial. I think this shows that the regulatory bodies found a balance point between realizing ALS has an unmet need and a need for more treatments while maintaining the rigor of the regulatory process. And so, Given this new information, the larger phase three study provides much higher confidence that the results that we're seeing reflect the true effect. And unfortunately, in this case, Albriosa does not show benefit for patients living with ALS. The recommendation from the, uh, the group of Canadian physicians managing patients living with ALS is to stop Albriosa as, there's as there is no longer a benefit to taking the medication and there remains risks of side effects and costs. The most likely outcome after uh, in the coming months would be because it was conditionally approved that either the company or Health Canada would remove it from the market. We can't be certain, but that would be anticipated. And so the afterglow, you know, looking at this story and, and unfortunately disappointing news to the uh, ALS community is, uh, you know, we do see some uh, positives at, at the end. You know, we, we do appreciate the company was quick and transparent with these trial results. Um, we've seen the company that made Albriosa actively engage in the ALS community and genuinely seeking to, to uh, do good work in this disease space. And it's shown a new model of, of drug development and, and research in, in ALS disease. And so I'm gonna transition then from that treatment, Albriosa, to another new treatment called Tofersin. And Tofersin is a medication for a certain subpopulation of ALS with a genetic mutation. And so it's helpful just to understand what that landscape looks like. 
ALS has approximately 10% of patients that have a family history, also known as familial ALS. The vast majority is sporadic and 90%. In either of these groups, whether you have a family history or no family history, there is a chance of confirming a genetic mutation. That percentage is much higher with the family history. And the reason why not everyone in that group has a confirmed genetic mutation is that there are still some genes being discovered. But that risk is not zero if there's no family history. But essentially, at this point, if you have family history, there's a 1 in 10 chance of having the SOD1 gene that I'm going to draw your attention to. And with no family history, there's a 1 in 100 chance of having that SOD1 gene mutation. SOD1 genetic ALS has a more clearly understood pathophysiology or understanding of why the disease develops. In this case, we're seeing that there's a mutation in the DNA that's resulting in an abnormal toxic protein to be accumulated. And this new drug that's been developed called tofersin works to block this mechanism, avoiding the toxic protein from accumulating and damaging the motor cell. The treatment itself is given through a lumbar puncture, a spinal tap into the fluid that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. And if we look back at the conceptualized upstream downstream mechanism, it seems more plausible that tofersin is acting upstream, targeting a toxic protein that's accumulating and triggering the downstream effects of motor neuron degeneration. And so there's some encouraging results from the study so far. And, and on a few slides here, you're gonna observe the data in a graph form here, but I'll explain it in words below. And so the first question is, you know, is tofersin actually doing what it should do? Is it reducing that upstream mechanism and reducing that toxic SOD1 protein? And, and the answer is yes, you know, up to about a third percent reduction in that toxic SOD1 protein, lower SOD1 toxic protein, less disease activity compared to the placebo where we see that value going up. Next, is it having an effect on ALS and, and the disease itself? And I'm gonna use an indirect marker here and talk about neural filament. And, and so when a nerve cell dies, it'll re release neural filament in the blood that we can measure. Higher neural filaments would mean more disease activity, more cells damaged and dying. And so in this case, we're seeing tofersin having a dramatic effect on reducing the neurofilament levels and compared to placebo where these neurofilament levels increased. If you're confused at the graphs here, this uh, dotted line right at 28 weeks is when everybody got started on the treatment. And so it's thought without knowing for sure yet that there's a reasonable likelihood that a reduction in neurofilament, if done early enough in the disease process, will have uh, or predict a clinically meaningful benefit and response. And it's with that information and value that uh, FDA has approved uh, tofersin, and I believe it's with Health Canada now to consider. Uh, Canada currently has a program with early access where patients with the mutation can access and be treated with this treatment right now. But to be balanced and open, there... There's more to the story in the same trial that showed those beneficial responses leading to approval in the United States. Um, at the end of the day, the primary outcome was the ALS FRS and this outcome marker at the 28 week mark when the study ended in the middle was negative. It did not reach a statistically significant difference. The treatment group only reduced, uh, had 1.2 less decrease in their ALS FRS at 28 weeks. When both groups got treated, going from 28 weeks all the way out to a year, there was a 3.5 less drop or decrease in the ALS FRS at 52 weeks, meaning tofersin did help prevent worsening of disease by three and a half points on that clinical scale. Patients have looked at this scale and provided input into what's a clinical meaningful response. And that response is a right around three, just over three actually. Um, and so certainly that early open label data does provide some corresponding benefits. This treatment does come with more side effects, partly because of the more invasive mechanism. Um, many of the common side effects 
are due to these spinal taps and lumbar punctures. The serious side effects are how the drug interacts with the brain by it being added to the spinal fluid, sometimes increasing pressure, causing inflammation in the spinal cord or inflammation in the nerve roots that can cause pain. And so Tofersen's horizon going forward, the same group of patients that were part of that initial study are still in the open label extension, as you heard from Paula. Um, and, and they're waiting till every patient in that open label extension hits three and a half years to show full follow-up results. We also have a first, a first ever in ALS history where there's a trial to look at asymptomatic disease. And so follow me carefully on this so that we don't misinterpret each other, but this is for patients who carry the SOD1 mutation but are not presenting with weakness or symptoms of ALS. They would be enrolled, and if they have the meet the criteria, they would undergo monthly neurofilament tests. As I mentioned, if that neurofilament level goes up, it's thought to indicate that ALS is um, about to come on. And so they're assessed. And if they're still asymptomatic without a clinical diagnosis of ALS, but the neurofilament levels go up, it's thought they could be presymptomatic and they would be randomized to either tofersen or placebo. If they're symptomatic, they go right away onto the drug. And so this has um, a lot of excitement within the uh, community, partly because it's uh, a first ever that we can uh, look at this, but also that the chance to treat very early in the disease could have much ro more robust results. And I'll finish here just on a, a point of, of how people undergo genetic testing, given I just talked about a treatment that's, you know, somewhat exciting within the disease space. For patients living with ALS, this diagnosis for genetic testing can be done as a panel or individual gene testing at the time of diagnosis or through your ALS clinic. If you're a family member of a patient living with ALS, you don't need genetic testing, except in the situation where you have a family member with a confirmed ALS gene mutation. In that situation, you can see your family doctor for a referral to a genetic specialist to undergo counseling and understand the results. Or if you have a SOD1 family history, you can reach out to an Atlas study site, which includes Calgary, Toronto, and Montreal. And thank you for your attention today. Thank you so much, Dr. Mobak. So now we can move over to the Q&A period. So there are some questions in the chat here. I'll read them out. Um, so, okay, so I see that uh, Dr. O'Connell, you answered uh, the first questions. Would you like to add more details? You're unmuted. You're muted. Sorry. Yeah. No. I. I. I would. Uh, I. I don't think I really have. Sorry. I'm just trying to get your your screen up here. Um. Hang on. There. Um. No. I. Uh. I. Like I said. I. I'm not a. Uh. A basic science researcher, and I cannot make. Uh elegant or eloquent uh, assessments of the details of each of the studies that I gave a very brief overview on in terms of the finer points of bioavailabilities at various doses with the various expedients carriers um, in, in the trials. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. O'Connell. So we have a question here for Dr. Pa uh, Pioro. So great presentation, Dr. Pioro. Reluzol is the only drug with some evidence of survival. Could you please let us know why none of the animal models used in ALS does not show any survival benefits in any model of mouse without preclinical? How could we move to clinical studies? Any thoughts? That's a really important question. Uh, thank you for asking that because we've been you know, struggling with um, finding a good model 
of ALS. And, and we really don't have very good animal models of ALS, as you mentioned about the rodents. So mice, primarily sometimes rat models of ALS, are really not, they're not representative of true human disease. Uh, at least, you know, the majority of studies that were done in the past using the SOD1 transgenic mouse, in other words, mice that are genetically engineered to overexpress that abnormal form of the SOD1 gene is different from what happens in humans who have SOD1 mutation. So it's, you know, in, in mice and, and in some rat models, it's just an overabundance of this abnormal uh, gene mutation, which is driving the system in a, in a very excessive way in, in individuals who have an SOD1 mutation. It really just takes one copy, just a single abnormal allele. In other words, one copy of that abnormal gene to cause a disease. So it's a different, it's like comparing apples to oranges. And we've really been, you know, challenged with using a model like SOD1, transgenic mice and, and rats to test whether a certain treatment is going to be effective in that rodent model and then translate it to, to humans. We really have not seen um, a direct relationship. You know, things that are tested in, in these mice usually are ineffective in, in humans for the most part. Now, there is an exception to that result. There have been a couple models in, in mice that have shown benefit um, that was effective in humans. But for the most part, we're really moving away from using the SOD1 mouse model as a model of true ALS for the most part. And, and it, you know, would represent, uh, as we heard before, a small percentage of, of ALS patients. So there are now newer models that are, have been developed and, and with some challenges with some other genetic mutations um, and particularly a protein that is universally found in all ALS cases, whether they're genetic or not, except for maybe the SOD1. And that's a, a protein, and we haven't heard the, the term, I don't think, today yet. It's called TDP43, TDP43. And it's abbreviation for a long name that, that represents the, a protein, a gene that codes for a protein that's very important inside every cell of our body. And it's normally in the nucleus, and it plays a large role there. There's a lot of work now that's been being done and, and has been done to try to understand how this abnormal protein in particular is, is um, kind of causing the disease to occur. So whether a person has a mutation or not, that at protein can become abnormal. And we know that in almost like 95, 98% or more of ALS individuals, individuals with ALS, that abnormal protein um, is is distributed in a way that it shouldn't be, and it's causing disease. So there's a lot of a lot of evidence for that. So there's some models now that are really focusing on developing TDP43 abnormality uh, in mice uh, and probably also other animals to study the effectiveness of drugs to to block a disease progression there. But we're still quite a ways away from having a good model um, to test new drugs and you know, the disappointments that we've had in that we don't find it, them very predictive of being effective in humans uh, is, is a challenge. And, you know, it's, it's a frustrating uh, situation to be in, but unfortunately, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of what we're struggling with. Uh, at the same time, it gives us some hints whether there may be a benefit, but really the proof is going to be in the pudding is whether uh, say these early phase two studies that we've heard about with some of these newer drugs that, you know, initially they showed some signal. And even with that, <clears throat> you know, we can't trust those results entirely until we test the drug in a, in a large number of, of individuals that it's not just by chance that this drug is having a benefit. Uh, and so that's a real challenge that we're facing right now. Sorry, that's, that's a, a long uh, explanation for your question, but but it, it, it is a complicated one, and, and it's an important one to consider uh, that, that we are struggling with finding a way to identify what new drugs may be of benefit to test in, in patients. And it's really by understanding better what's causing the disease and then targeting those mechanisms 
with a drug that that blocks that particular pathway that we heard uh, you know discussed earlier about you know the, the rivers coming down the mountain. Once we start to understand what's causing these individual um, mechanisms and getting closer to that cause to the to the iceberg at the top of the mountain, uh, if we can block it up there, that's going to be the key. The key thing is to try to stop it before it, it's it's causing all these downstream effects. Great, thank you so much. So the next question, next question, I believe, is for Dr. Mobag. Uh, FDA approved Tofersen, however, UK did not. Why would they not approve? Each regulatory body will be different in terms of, uh, you know, what's the bar of, of uh, proof that a drug works and is reasonably safe to bring to their, uh, you know, patient population for which they are regulatory um, and monitoring. The uh, bar is typically a little bit higher in Europe overall, as we've seen with the Adarabone story. Um, you know, for Tofersen, there are there is more data coming. I think over time we'll have a more clear understanding. Does neurofil neurofilament reduction truly predict uh, clinical outcomes? Does the three and a half year follow up of open label extension show a much more dramatic benefit? Um, so there will be more data coming, and and then there's already real world data supporting some of that phase three Valor trial out there. And so it, it's a dynamic situation and regulatory bodies will have that bar that uh, needs to get over to serve their population. Great, thank you. I think the next question is for Dr. Kiyoho. Reluzol comes in an oral film. Is that available in Calgary or does it need a new prescription? It is a prescription. Um, I'm probably not the best person to ask about what's available in uh, in Canada since I've just moved from the States and I'm not sure what the uh, availability is for some of these forms. Maybe uh, one of the other uh, Canadian ALS docs can, can comment on that. Hmm. I'm, not a, I'm not aware of it. No. Um. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I guess the, the Tiglutic is available in Canada, correct? The liquid form? Not 100% sure of that either. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I guess I, right I've now... never, uh, I've been prescribing Rylazole for 24 years and I, I've only ever prescribed it orally. Uh, but I leave it open to the formulation that the patient may pick up at the pharmacy. So whether they've gotten it, sometimes I've asked a pharmacy to compound it to make it easier for someone to maybe use it in, in, a, in a feeding tube. Um, certainly I'll look into what's available now, but uh, if it's available in one province, yeah. it should be available Canada-wide. That's I, I would hope so. I know that each province may... Yeah. regulate it differently but um you know and that's that's the difference that we we don't quite we're not completely the same across the border unfortunately um that you know i think some of these other formulations that are non-tablet form make it easier to swallow for individuals that have a lot of swallowing problems dysphagia um you know crushing the tablets is certainly the way that people will do it to put through a peg tube and all but it can cause clogging. You may lose some of the medication, you know, things like that. Um, and, and so it's it's good to have a formulation that allows it easily, um, you know, to get in through a tube, like a liquid form. The Tiglutic, which is uh, a, a nectar-thick form of it, so you can drink it uh, as well. So it's, it's easier to go down as a slightly thicker solution or put it through the peg tube. It's, it's approved for that. Uh, and then the film um, that I had mentioned uh, there's at least one company, uh, MT Pharma, in the United States that that uh, provides it that way. It would be interesting to see whether MT Pharma has the you know ability to supply it in Canada as well, because I think that could be a benefit for for individuals. So we'll have to look into that. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question I think is for all. Please discuss gene splicing treatments to replace damaged DNA producing malformed 3D enzyme shapes. And this question is regarding the 30 plus mutations identified so far. 
I can start with a comment. Um, you know, first of all, the, the genetic treatment right now is an antisense oligonucleotide, which essentially means it's a compound that blocks the transcription from the RNA to a protein to, to accumulate that toxic protein, but it's not a splicing um, genetic uh, alteration. Currently, genetic treatments are going on with SOD1 patients. Uh, there's some ATAX in two studies and C9R studies that I'm aware of at the moment. And hopefully there's a, you know, cascade to other genetic mutations, but you'll see that even just between two of the mutations, SOD1 and C9R, that accounts for uh, over 50% of genetic forms of ALS. And so those would be the most applicable to the most number of people. And after that, the numbers of people that would benefit from the very specific mutation and treatments that correlated with them become very small. And so that might take longer to develop. I'll mention that the, um, uh, you know, the, the question is, is it, it's really addressing the holy grail of, of almost any kind of you know, treatment, uh, any kind of genetic treatment, I guess, whether it's for ALS or other diseases, if we can edit the gene that's causing the abnormality, um, then, you know, that that would allow us to target that specific mutation. And that wasn't possible at all until quite recently with the discovery of the CRISPR-Cas9. And the person who's asking the question to me, very well know about that that uh, discovery and the technology that's now you know become available and is is really burgeoning uh, field right now of, of discovery of of how can we use this CRISPR technology to actually manipulate the abnormal gene that's causing the disease whatever condition it is we're still very early stages with with any kind of disorders in thalassemia for example it's it's now sort of uh, been identified that it can really be effective. That's a blood disorder. But when it comes to um, uh, neurologic diseases, uh, for example, ALS, we're still far away from you know being able to use gene editing to cut out that abnormal uh, part of the of the uh, DNA and and change it uh, so that we have a normal gene. But it is going to be possible. I'm I'm sure of it. Um, how quickly you know can we get there is 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 the question. But the, the speed, the pace at which molecular biology has been advancing, our discoveries about understanding how genes work and how to manipulate them has accelerated so much, even in the last five or 10 years, that, that you know, hopefully that pace will continue and we'll, we'll get to that point uh, much sooner than, than we could have ever imagined. But at the same time, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Mulbeck uh, mentioned, you know, the, the techniques that are available now are are using one specific approach, which we've been quite familiar with now for quite a few years. Uh, but even that, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago, let's say, uh, was unheard of. So, you know, we're, we're really making major advances in being able to, to manipulate the actual gene cause of ALS. Uh, one thing I just, just quickly mentioned that, that, you know, these techniques are also starting to be used for the non-genetic causes of ALS. So that 85 to 90% uh, population of individuals who develop ALS who do not have any genetic cause, there are some approaches now that are being looked at and being tested to block that abnormal proteins effect. The one that I mentioned, TDP43, there are some approaches now that are being developed to actually block the damaging effect of that TDP43 not doing its, its normal function. And so that sort of treatment is really what we need is something that's gonna be applicable to every patient who has ALS, whether or not they have a genetic abnormality or not. So that's gonna be the real key um, you know, way to approach this disease. So can I, I, I would like to add a word of caution to this. Um, there are two issues we need to be aware of. One is that <clears throat> all these proteins are normal proteins in the body, and they're very important because they do many good things. It's when they go wrong that they do bad things. The other thing is that a given protein or gene does, doesn't work in isolation. Tons of genes, they talk to each other, and the problem is sometimes they 
malmouth, bell talk badly to each other. So you really need to understand a lot more than a single gene or a single protein. Um, and I think in terms of TDP43 is a good example. I like to think of it as, um, I think the accumulation or aggregation of TD43, as Eric says, is bad. I think that is, in the end, what causes the neurons to become sick and you get ALS. But wh why, why does TDB43 start to misbehave? And I know we don't have a full answer to that, but I think one of the major problems is that our, our nervous system, our whole body for that matter, has a whole system of of garbage collectors, and and the garbage collectors start working at birth. They make sure every day that they clean up the bad garbage in our brain and take it away. And the problem is, just in real life, we have some lazy garbage collectors. They're genetically lazy and don't do the work properly. And there are other garbage collectors that don't like the environment they work in. They say, "Oh, it's too hot and too dirty," and I'm going to. I'm not going to clean garbage today. It's not nice to me. And the problem is this group of not very good garbage collectors sit do this bad work for 20, 30, 40 years. So that TDB43, then its gagrants start to accumulate. So I think it's vital that we start to look at what makes TDB43 and Alzheimer proteins and Parkinson proteins, they're all the same. What makes them not function, start to accumulate, and it's largely because bad garbage collection, in, put in simple terms. What do you think about that, Eric? <laughs> I like the analogy. Um, yeah, they're, they're going on strike too much. You know, certainly that is one element, uh, the accumulation, but it's, it's also the loss, for example, if we're talking about TDP43, you know, or any protein, it's not only it accumulates, maybe a bad form of it accumulates or accumulates in the wrong place and gums up the works, but it's also partly related to its loss of its function, what it's normally supposed to be doing. And we know that there's a lot of important things that TDP43 should be doing to DNA and to RNA that it's unable to do. And so some of those things that, that can be targeted to correct for can be replacing or making that TDP43 work better as well. But what you're saying is completely correct. I mean, it's a combination of, of the gain of some kind of toxic function where it, the protein may accumulate and gum up the works, or, and it's also a loss of its normal function that's playing a role here. So one of the, one of the answers, and it may be a small answer or a big answer, we don't know, to that issue of gain of function, loss of function is, all of the neurodegenerations largely present as we get older, the age related and, and the risk gets higher the older you get. And if you look at the, the pathophysiology, if that's the right term of aging, many of the molecular biological functions of aging are the very same ones that go wrong in ALS and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that these neurodegenerations are due to aging, but aging is a very important factor correlating with, with the protein function. And we have to take that into account as well and try and understand that. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, we have two minutes left, so I'd like uh, to take the opportunity to thank all of the speakers today for your presentations and also for the people that attended. If any of you have any final words, I will share the link to the survey in the chat and I will share a QR code on my screen so that you can scan it and do it on the spot if you'd like. Thank you so much, everyone. I don't know if any of the speakers wanted to have, share any final thoughts before we end the session today.
I, I would just say to everybody that it's it's been a very exciting time over the past decade with so many more discoveries. But at the same time, we do recognize how incredibly challenging it has to be to be living with a condition and still have, you know, see some of the trials that don't work or things that seem to work and then they get, then the evidence seems to conflict that. Uh, but I do feel optimistic. And I think many of us who work in this field do feel that, you know, we, we, we are getting closer to having better understanding and as well, such better collaboration internationally with sharing and, and working together towards solutions. Nicely said, Colleen. I agree fully. Very nice. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today and have a nice rest of your day. Thank you.